All right, welcome back to the Psychopathy series. And this video is on nature versus nurture. And I'll, I'll spoil the video now. I'm not going to give you a, a conclusive answer. But what I will do is go into the biological correlates of psychopathy and then also go into some of the developmental aspects of psychopathy. So to start, I think nature versus nurture does a bad job of capturing the language of how genes and the environment interact. I think there's something satisfying about asking questions like, are psychopaths made or are they born? But unfortunately, like most things in psychology, these things are so complex and they never have straightforward answers. So nature and nurture aren't these two mutually exclusive entities. They're deeply embedded in one another and interact in very complex ways. So I prefer the phrase nature via nurture because I think that language does a better job of capturing the interaction of the two. So the heritability of psychopathy is about 50%, but that doesn't mean it's half genetics and half environment. And so I made another video you can watch to clarify why heritability doesn't mean genetics per se. But for context, something like schizophrenia and bipolar has a heritability of about 80%. So heritability is not fate. It's not something that's immutable. And just because a trait is heritable and exists in your parents, it doesn't mean that you're destined to have that trait. So if you consider something like obesity, which has a heritability of 70 to 80%, you can get a good grasp on the fact that it's not something you're born with, but it's also not something entirely dependent on the environment. I think the design team caught wind that corporate was making some cutbacks here at Psycho Farm. They really stubbed their game here. Normally I find the yin yang just a little, I don't know, tacky. But here I think it's, it's pretty classy in this context. So let's get started on the nature side of things. So while the idea that there's a criminal gene is complete nonsense, there is growing evidence that psychopathic behavior does have some grounding in genetics and biology. So anyone who's had multiple kids know that infants just differ in temperament. Sometimes they're chill, sometimes they're difficult, and it can be the exact same household. So temperamentally, psychopaths are known to differ in their constitutional aggressivity. So some of those areas include their activity level, their aggressiveness, their reactivity, their consolability, um, and other factors that tilt them towards being a little bit more aggressive. So next I wanna go into the biochemical and genetic predispositions that increase your susceptibility to psychopathy. So one thing I really wanna emphasize is that if you have one of these genes, it doesn't make you a psychopath. If you have every single gene that is correlated to psychopathy, it doesn't mean you're gonna be a psychopath. It just means that you have an increased susceptibility compared to someone who didn't have that gene. So the first is variation in monoamine oxidase A, and that enzyme is responsible for breaking down neurotransmitters. It acts non-specifically on norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. So if someone had a low expression variant, you'd expect them to have higher levels of those monoamine transmitters. So it's been found that people who have that variation are more likely to develop violent and antisocial patterns of behavior. Next is a variant in BDNF that causes it to be less active. So BDNF is a protein that is made by neurons and glial cells, and it promotes the growth and activity of brain cells. It's almost like the miracle growth of the brain. So individuals who have this genetic variant have less cortical thickness, and it's believed they do a poorer job of just cognitive processing in general, and especially in the prefrontal cortex that's responsible for making moral judgments. The next one is that some abnormalities in receptor systems is linked to psychopathy. So for example, it's known that variations in the serotonin transporter yields different traits and susceptibilities. So one example is 5-HTTP-LPR, which is a long allele for the serotonin transporter. It's known to be protective against internalizing disorders, but it also may cause an increased susceptibility to psychopathy. And also there's some evidence that dysregulation of the endogenous opioid system is linked to an increased susceptibility. And lastly, it's known that high levels of testosterone and low levels of cortisol are linked to psychopathy. And this makes sense because testosterone is involved in approach-related behavior and rewards sensitivity and fear reduction. So next I want to go into some of the neural changes that are known to occur in psychopathy. So the first is that psychopaths have a remarkably low reactivity to their autonomic nervous system. So the ANS is what's involved in the fight or flight response. So this likely explains their sensation seeking and failure to learn from experience and and poor conditioning to painful stimuli. Because the ANS gets triggered during events that invoke fear and anxiety, so someone who didn't have the appropriate response at that time wouldn't avoid things that normal people would avoid. So it also leads to a lower threshold of impulsive behavior. So here's a quote from Jeffrey Dahmer discussing a behavior that no normal person would ever do. Afterwards, were you repulsed? Were you upset? No, it, at the time, uh, it, was, it was almost addictive. It was almost uh, a surge of energy. So humans like a little bit of their autonomic nervous system engaged. That's why we're drawn to things like roller coasters or haunted houses, because it gives us a thrill. I think for Jeffrey Dahmer to feel something similar, he had to do really bad stuff. So the next thing is that psychopaths have abnormalities in the strength of their connections of their neural circuits. So again, this is part nurture, but it's known that early neglect can affect the development of the orbitofrontal cortex, which is kind of like the moral center of the brain. So it's involved in sensory integration in order to carry out its function in decision-making and expectation. In particular, it compares the expected reward and punishment with the actual reward and punishment. So it's really important in adaptive learning. And it does this with its connection with the limbic system. So it's involved in emotion and memory. So in particular, like it's amygdala and hippocampus. So by having a poor connectivity, psychopaths have difficulty in judging whether they should or shouldn't do something and evaluating the emotional context of situations. 
situations. Imagine making decisions without the part of the brain that says, is this a good idea? Does this fit in with my morality? So psychopaths also have a hypoactive amygdala and the amygdala is in the temporal lobe and it's engaged in monitoring the environment for threats and then generating an anxiety response when fear is present. So if you find yourself not monitoring for threats and not really experiencing fear, you're gonna find yourself in some pretty stupid situations. It's also known psychopaths have anomalies in linguistic processes. And this is probably related to the weak connectivity in the brain that's responsible for synthesizing the emotional context of things and the cognitive context of things. And there's also something called Hare's lateralization theory. And he believed that psychopaths differ in how they process the affective aspects of language. And he believed they had limited left hemispheric resources for processing linguistic stimuli. And he used this to explain why psychopaths have smaller physiological responses to emotional connotations of descriptive statements or pictures compared to non-psychopaths. And again, I'm never terribly impressed with neural or biochemical interpretations of diagnoses like this. There's just too much variability person to person that not much can be said about any particular one gene or one neural deficit or one biochemical deficiency. So the thing I just want you to take away is that there are biochemical aspects to these diseases, but it's important not to use these things to develop a fatalistic attitude toward any one disease. There's just too much interaction between genetics and environment for any one genetic predisposition to be a sentence to becoming a psychopath. I just find that ascribing personality disorders to genetics or biochemistry can be abused and can be used to decrease empathy, whereas I find focus on the developmental and the nurture aspect of things allows us to focus on things that can change and can be addressed by psychological and social interventions. So next, let's go into the nurture aspect of things. 